Welcome to the Report Card with Nat Malkus, the education policy podcast from the American Enterprise Institute. The coronavirus pandemic has brought newfound attention to the world of homeschooling. Indeed, over the past three months, nearly every student in America has got some taste of what home-based learning has to offer. And as families have found out, homeschooling has its ups and downs. On the plus side, it can give parents the chance to spend more time with their children, more deeply engage in their kids' schooling, and provide learning opportunities that are uniquely tailored to their children's interests. On the flip side, all that takes a lot of time, and homeschooling can lack the community that usually comes along with attending school. The ideal option for many students, it seems, might be something in the middle. As it turns out, that something has a name, hybrid homeschooling. On this episode of The Report Card, I talked with Mike McShane, who recently wrote about hybrid homeschooling for AEI's Sketching a New Conservative Ed Agenda paper series. Mike is the Director of National Research at EdChoice and an Adjunct Fellow in Education Policy Studies here at AEI. He's also a Senior Fellow at the Show Me Institute. Mike, welcome to the report card. Great to be with you, Nat. So Mike, first of all, let me just say, you know, it's been a while since you've been full-time at AEI. It's been, what, five years or so. So let me just first say, it's great to get the band together. I know, right? Like, let's put this show on the road, man. All right, let's do it. So I do want to talk about hybrid homeschooling, you know, sort of the next level stuff. But first, let's just do a little of the basics. What's the working definition for homeschooling, especially given all the many forms that are similar to it that people have been experiencing in the past few months? And how many kids, at least before coronavirus hit, we're engaged in it. So to answer your second question first, I think the most recent statistics we have from NCES say something around 1.7 million students, it's estimated, uh, are homeschooled. That's up. It's almost doubled since the turn of the century. I think in the, the survey of it that was done in 99 or something that put it at eight or 900,000 students. So yeah, we're talking about 1.7 million. So if we think you know, there's what, 3 million kids in charter schools, about 6 million kids in private schools. That gives you the sort of scope of, of what we're looking at there. And so generally, the, the working definition of homeschooling is children who are educated in their homes where their education is directed, overseen, and financed by their parents. Now, different organizations for statistical purposes or for advocacy purposes, set different definitions where they say, you know, at least 51% of the education has to take place within their home or 65% or whatever it is has to be in their home. Because as you mentioned, homeschooling parents for years have been doing things like getting involved in co-ops with one another, hiring private tutors for subjects that they're not necessarily, you know, capable or want to teach themselves. But that's a general working definition is you think, children that are educated at home and their education is sort of overseen, financed, managed by their own parents. And to some degree, Mike, I mean, you're you're talking about a lot of kids and you're going to get a lot of variation in here. So of course, a lot of these kids are going to like dip their toe in the public schools for specific things. I I mean, is that right? Do they cross these boundaries? Yeah, I want to say something like 15 states allow for part-time enrollment in public schools. So schools that can take a mail card. And there are lots of private schools and other providers that are out there that students can take courses kind of a la carte from. So let's go to the why. What's the motivation of, uh, of most people to engage in a homeschooling project that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort? Yeah, I think generally speaking, the folks who homeschool just have a kind of fundamental belief that they think they can provide a higher quality education to their students than the school can. So in some sort of survey data and stuff, you could almost view it as like some people have a, a sort of, I don't know if you want to call it a negative motivation, which is that they look at schools and they don't like them and they don't like the culture of the school. They don't like the pedagogy of the school or they don't like what's going on, the, the sort of peer group that students might be in or bullying or any of those sorts of issues. And they want to keep their kids away from that, sort of protect them from that. Then the other sort of flip side of it is if you want to call it maybe the more positive motivation, which is just parents think they can do a better job. They think that they're they can do a better job of picking the curriculum, that they can pick the resources better, that they have the freedom to, to go to museums and go on field trips and do all sorts of stuff that are there where they can kind of customize the education that best fits their children. They can work with other people where it makes sense and they can stay on their own where, where it makes sense. But fundamentally, I think it's just a belief that they think they can do better than the other options that are available. What are some of the ways that the motivations of homeschoolers are misunderstood or maligned? And I'll just drop one name in there as priming, who's sort of 
brought this to the fore uh, in Harvard Magazine this spring, the uh, Professor Elizabeth Barthollet. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the big argument that she made there was that, you know, um, homeschooling is a situation that's like ripe for child abuse, you know, because children don't have access to mandated reporters or anything like that, that, that it's actually an environment that can be really dangerous for children. And that dovetails with arguments that have been made before. And there, there's, a, there's this big kind of question around, you know, what rights do children have? What rights do they have outside of their parents? Like, are they like full citizens? Are they somehow some sort of middle ground where their parents are in charge of them? And I think, you know, different people disagree on, on how, to, how to interpret those things. Look, I think generally speaking, though, there's very little evidence that, so for example, the, these most extreme cases of things like abuse or any of those things, there's very little evidence that happens at any higher rates in, in homeschool environments than it does in traditional school environments, whether that's public school environments or private school environments. It's not Now, there have been a few of these really high-profile cases that have taken place that have been, to be sure, absolutely horrifying, like absolutely horrifying situations. But whether this is like an actual systematic issue, I, I, and, and, and even in the articles that uh, Dr. Bartholet wrote, she doesn't actually present evidence for that. She has this kind of anecdata where she like throws out six or seven of these, again, admittedly horrific stories, and then sort of paints that all with a broad brush. And you would think you could do the same thing to traditional public schools, right? Like you could find five or six horrific stories of things that happen in public schools, but you wouldn't necessarily say, okay, obviously that's why we need to abolish public schooling now. So I get though, look, some people are naturally skeptical. Generally speaking, you know, throughout the history of of homeschooling. It's important to note, even from the start, that there were basically two groups of people that were brought, and there's a great book on this for people who are interested, Kingdom of Children, that was written by Mitchell Stevens, tells this story better than I will be able to summarize right now. But that there were these more, if you want to consider them the more kind of left-leaning, I don't know if you want to say hippie, if you want to say more like, you know, children are, uh, it's almost kind of like a Rousseauian vision where like children are these precious creatures that are sort of crushed by the system. And so we want to keep our kids out of that system so that they don't become like, you know, a tool of the man, you know, like something. So, but it was a very, very sort of progressive view of child psychology, child development. And that's why they wanted, John Holt was a guy that was famous and sort of pushing this. And then on the other side of this was a more conservative overwhelmingly evangelical Christian approach that had just different views about raising children, but a sort of skepticism of the traditional public schooling system that had certain values, virtues, religious uh, religious ethos that parents wanted to make sure that were instilled in their children. And so they, they homeschooled for that reason. So over time, the sort of right side of that became more popular, like in the 80s and 90s, when we saw like a real explosion of of homeschooling, they were more likely to be Christian, more likely to be white, more likely to be those groups. But interestingly, you know, in recent years, a lot of the research that's being done about homeschooling families is really starting to highlight different groups of people that are homeschooling for different reasons. So a really fast growing group of homeschoolers are African Americans. So you have African American families who don't really think that traditional schools you know, hold their children in high enough regard, have high enough expectations for them, teach a curriculum and sort of resources and history and all of those things that are reflective of their values and their experiences. There's also been growth in a lot of families of students with special needs. You have lots and lots of families that do not feel that traditional schools, traditional public schools or traditional private schools are really helping their children with special needs in the best ways that they can. And so you have those folks that are starting to do it as well. So the difficult thing is that you know, people homeschool for lots and lots of different reasons. And so casting with like too broad of a brush about homeschoolers is just inevitably going to cause you to make mistakes. Sure. And, you know, again, just to put it back into the perspective of the numbers, half the kids that are in charters, that's the size of the homeschool population. Yeah. It's probably going to have a lot of different flavors in it. For sure. All right. Hybrid homeschooling. As if this isn't different enough, uh, homeschooling is off the beaten path. What is hybrid homeschooling and how does it differ from the idea of, you know, sort of our traditional notions of homeschooling? Yeah. So hybrid homeschools are schools where children attend sort of traditional brick and mortar schooling for some portion of the week and are homeschooled for some portion of the week. So they vary wildly. It spans everything from children spending one day at home and four days at school, all the way to four days at home and one day at school and everything in between. So two and three and three and two. 
to meet my definition of a hybrid homeschool, generally speaking, the program has to meet three criteria. I say it has to be regular, it has to be substantial, and it has to be structured. So what I mean by regular is that it's got to be at least for one full school day a week. So one, at least one day a week, children are going outside of their homes to a school. I say that it's regular, so sort of that same idea that there's some, you know, enrichment programs or others where kids meet sort of episodically, uh, you know, they may be two days one week and they don't meet for two weeks and they do something. So there's like a regular structured program that is offered by a school. Or the interesting thing is that this is offered by private schools, it's offered by charter schools, it's offered by traditional public school districts. But yeah, it's some bridging between some portion of the time is spent at home and some of the time is spent in a you know brick and mortar school. All right. So in these schools, it, I mean, let's just start out with the basics. Who decides on the curriculum, right? Because to some degree, if you have parents that are sort of in charge of the time at home, and then you have the school that has one, two, three, whatever days of the week that they're doing in the homeschool, who's directing the curriculum? So it varies. I mean, a lot of these schools are structured differently. So I'll use sort of as an example, one of the most popular models on the private school side are what are called the university model schools. It's a network of around 80 schools across the country, private, I think, all of them are, are religious schools. I could be wrong about that, but I think most of them are, are religious schools. And in that case, the school sets the curriculum. The school sets the, you know, the homework. It's just that for, in most of their cases, for two days, um, the children do that work at home. So you would go to school on Monday. And, you know, I've been who visited a school like this. And uh, like, if you're in the school, it looks just like any other school you've ever been in, right? Like kids are going from class to class. Everything's basically the same, but just on Tuesday, they work from home. And then on Wednesday, they're back in school normally. Thursday, they go from home. And again, it varies. So in some of these schools, in the lower grades, they'll do two days at school and three days at home. So, but, so in that place, the curriculum is chosen by the school. The assignments are done by the school. You have a teacher that's doing that, doing all of the sort of traditional things that teachers do, but you just have sort of more, more independent work. More work is done at home. Now, in some of the public, uh, in some of the charter schools that do this, in some of the public schools that do this, depending on the regulations from the state. So, for example, Michigan has a lot of what they call parent partnership programs. But in those cases, Michigan law says that none of those classes can be core classes. So they have to be only enrichment classes that students take. So in that case, obviously, most of the curriculum and all those things are being done, the, the sort of traditional education is being done by the parents. But these enrichment programs that students are taking, uh, all of that stuff is being managed by the school. So it's a sort of, it's again, you know, it's, it's actually very difficult to, to, to speak in very clear terms about these schools because there's actually a lot of variation amongst them. So it sounds like hybrid homeschooling is going to require, you know, quite a bit of, you know, agreement between parents and a school. I'm curious, where is this hybrid homeschooling taking place and how common is it? I mean, how many... What give me shoot me a rough percentage of that 1.7 million kids that are involved in these kinds of programs? Yeah, I would say you know it's actually really hard to find that number because frankly, lots of these schools, you know, hybrid homeschool is not in their name. You know, they're just they're just called whatever. They just have like a a, a sort of normal school name. And even sometimes if you go to their website, you have to go like three or four pages deep before you realize like oh wait they don't actually go to school every day in the week. It's very so. I would say that the total number of schools is in the hundreds. That's probably about how many that we're talking about. So it's still relatively small. Like the university model network, I think, is about 80 schools where they're concentrated. So those schools and, and a lot of the sort of private hybrid homeschool models started cropping up in the Dallas Metroplex area. The first one was a school called Grace Prep. It started in the early 1990s. It was a big sort of fanning out from there, but that was a big place where it started. There's another big pocket of these schools more on the, the, um, on the public side in Colorado and the kind of corridor between Colorado Springs and, I mean, if you head north to like sort of Boulder and Fort Collins, part of that has to do with Colorado has a, an interesting law, a part-time enrollment law that if students attend, I think it's between 90 and 360 hours in a school, they can get half of their funding. So you have lots of schools that cropped up there that have these one and two day a week programs that they can get the funding from. There's also a long tradition of this in California, 
You had in a lot of cases there, California has a tradition of correspondence schools, especially for like dropout recovery programs and others. And in many of those cases, these schools found out that, you know, students were working through, you know, packets of information and they just weren't, you know, they were not meeting with success with that. And so they said, well, what if we had kids come in one day a week or two day a week that the kids might not thrive in a traditional schooling environment? But if they only had to come in once a week or twice a week and then work from home the rest of the time, maybe that would be a way for them to to work out. And like I said, Michigan has a lot of these programs um, as well on the public school side. So a lot of it on the public side really depends on the policy environment. So do you have things like part-time enrollment statutes? Do you have seat time waivers that that schools are able to apply to? Do you have competency-based frameworks that allow you to get funding by sort of demonstrating what students learn as opposed to how much time they spent in there? And then obviously on the private school side, it matters a lot around what your state homeschooling regulations are, what your private school regulations are, and the degree to which those schools have to meet things like seat time requirements, curriculum requirements, all that sort of stuff. Talk to me about the trajectory on these. I mean, is this something that's just been flying under the radar so most people don't talk about it? Or is it something that's, you know, on a growth trajectory? I think it's definitely on a growth trajectory. Now, it's hard for me, like I said, because it's hard to get these exact numbers of them. I mean, if you look at these networks, they're like the network, like university model schools, like they are growing. And I can just tell you, just again, this is more anecdotal, but you know, when I talk to people that this is the research that I'm working on, or when I talk to this, like it astounds me how many people are like, oh yeah, we totally do that. Or like my my uh, my cousins do that, or like like there's there's no no more than like one or two degrees of separation from someone who's like oh yeah like I totally know about that. And frankly, the other people when I tell people about these schools, lots of folks say like oh my god I would love to do that. And like even teachers are like I would love to teach in that school, and parents are like I would love to do something like that. So I think this is definitely uh, an area for growth. I think that it, it's you know there's all of these sort of trends about how work is changing and. You know, there are probably a fair number of parents that would be interested in, in homeschooling, but they don't want to homeschool full-time, and they're interested in working, but they don't want to work full-time, so they can work part-time and homeschool part-time. Most of these schools, particularly the private schools, are able to, as you might imagine, charge very low rates of tuition, so some of them $4,000, $5,000 a year. So that can be a big, you know, a big burden off of parents' shoulders, so maybe both parents don't have to work. Someone can work part-time. You could still have these schooling things. So I think it's pretty well primed. And then obviously you have all this stuff happening with the coronavirus where suddenly everyone's saying we want to try some sort of hybrid homeschool model in in the fall. But sort of just like, you know, I think it's fair to say sort of what has been happening hasn't really been homeschooling. You know, like homeschooling is a much more conscious decision that people make after like a lot of thought. And this has more just been like, you know, schooling at home to try and make up for what's happening. And I think Frankly, a lot of the stuff that they're talking about happening in the fall will sort of be hybrid homeschooling, but it's not going to be like as intentional as these models are in, in trying to accomplish the things that they're accomplishing. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask about that. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are saying, you know, we can only handle half our kids. So we're going to have kids come in for two days and then they're going to do three days off. And in the latter half of the week, we're going to have the other half of the kids come on for two days. That sounds like hybrid homeschooling, but you're right. I mean, there's a material difference when you have a choice to engage in that kind of schooling and when, well, you know, the virus forces. Them. Yeah. And I think a lot of it hinges on, and I think the success of this or, or, or sort of lessons that can be learned from hybrid homeschools that already exist, a lot of it is going to hinge on exactly how, like, so there's this conversation of how many children in the building, we need half the kids to stay at home and half the kids to go, well, so what do we mean by that? Do you mean that your building needs to be at like half capacity or quarter capacity? Or does that go all the way down to the classroom level? So for example, if this is done at like the building level, I think that it is possible to learn some things from hybrid homeschooling because what you would say is, let's say the third grade, the fifth grade, and the seventh grade are here on Monday. And then the second grade, fourth grade, sixth grade are on, on the other days. But all of the second graders are there at the same time. All of the fourth graders are there at the same time you could do some of the things that hybrid homeschools do in, in sort of stretching the instruction over multiple days spread between home and school. But if instead what we're really talking about is like this has to be at the classroom level. So that means that like half of the fourth graders will be at home and half of the fourth graders will be in the school. Like that's not how hybrid homeschools operate. Like hybrid homeschools, all of the kids are there for half of the time. Like they're all there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're all at home Tuesday, Thursday. And that allows you to plan for that. But I don't know how one plans for 
if you have half of your kids are working from home and half of your kids are working from school at any one time, it would be exceedingly challenging. Mike, you recently wrote in this AI paper series, the conservative ed agenda paper series on hybrid homeschooling. And in that, you say that any conservative education policy should meet three criteria. So let's sort of trip down these. I kind of want to know just more broadly why you put these out there, but also how hybrid homeschooling checks those boxes. Uh, The first one is recognizing the primacy of the family. What do you mean by that? And how does it, uh, you know, fit nicely with hybrid homeschooling? Yeah, so this was a I think, and it's such a cool thing that that y'all are doing this this paper series. And when um, you know Rick asked me to write a paper for it, because I think right now you know there's so many conversations in conservatism in general and conservatism in education. I think it's like really in flux, and like what it means to be a conservative is not exactly clear given the kind of politics of the moment. And even in education, there's been debate for a long a long time. Like, well, what what are conservatives for? And, and Rick did that that great piece that was on it that's that's important because you know there have been you know there were the sort of pro accountability people that were kind of more big that's like a more like big government conservative thing and then you have the more school choice people that are more libertarian so one of the things i tried to set out in that piece was like if we're going to talk about what conservatives are we should try and track back to some fundamental principles so like what are some bedrock principles of conservatism and then like how do the policies that we want to advocate for either align to or are in conflict with that And so I think there are a few more conservative ideas than this idea that the family is a sort of bedrock of society, that, you know, if we have broken families or if we sort of usurp the role of the family, bad things happen, right? Like the the, the families are important and we think of the family as a sort of fundamental organizing unit of society. So to me, any conservative education policy has got to start there and has got to say, look, the family is the fundamental organizing unit. And we exist to try and help that, to try and supplement that, to try and sort of help it where it falls down and to, to, to just to try and work with it. So to me, you know, that's, that's hybrid homeschooling, right? These, these schools say, listen, you all are, are in charge. You are the kind of drivers of your children's education, and we are here to help you. We are here to supplement the stuff that you can't do. We're here to provide support in the areas that you can't. And the story of a lot of these hybrid homeschools were that you know you had homeschooling families that as kids got older, they kind of lost the ability. So families weren't able to teach higher level math and science courses, or they, they weren't comfortable with these things. And so they said, look, why don't we band together? We'll start the school to, to supplement what we can't, what we're not able to do. So to me, like that's, that is just like a fundamental conservative principle. And it seems to me that hybrid homeschooling is based around a recognition of that fact. And the second point you bring up, uh, not too far afield, that uh, we should be working with civil society instead of supplanting it. First of all, civil society is one of those terms that, you know, uh, conservatives love to talk about and other people say, huh? Um, So what do you mean by that? Working with civil society? Yeah, so generally the civil society is the whole range of organizations and institutions that sort of exist between individuals and the state, right? So we have the government and then we have all of us kind of alone by ourselves. And then these mediating institutions that sit between us, right? And schools are like a great example of those. But there's also, you know, there's the Boy Scouts and uh, the T-Bowl League and the Kiwanis Club and like all of these. And so, yeah, so again, I think this is just like a fundamental, if you go back to Edmund Burke, or you look at like Alexis de Tocqueville's views of America from 200 years ago, you know, it's this fundamental American value and conservative value that we look to these intermediary institutions to both connect us to one another, to solve society's problems. It's not something that we immediately feel something is wrong, so the government needs to fix it. And so I think hybrid homeschooling is, again, another great example of this, where it's leveraging the civil society. So these are these independent institutions. Um, Yuval Levin wrote that great book that came out earlier this year, A Time to Build. And he loves to, to quote, he's an older Spanish philosopher, sociologist, or someone that says, you know, people don't come together to be together. They come together to do things together. And so uh, hybrid homeschools are a great example of this. They're these little communities where these families who have this kind of different idea about education, have a different idea about child rearing, they have a chance to come together and they build this thing together. They build this school together and they work with one another and they are, they're vulnerable with one another because they have to admit the things that they're not able to do that they need the school to be able to do for them. And so it creates these beautiful tight-knit communities 
that again, sort of sit between the atomized individual and the state. And I tend to think that, you know, a, a country, a community that's rich with those types of intermediary institutions are just stronger. They're better. People are happier. People are safer. Um, people are more secure because they have this sort of net, this sort of, I think of it around children. Imagine like drawing a series of like concentric circles. And it's true for adults as well, right? Imagine if you have your church and you have your some civic organization that you're involved in and you have a school and all of those people care about you and you care about them. God forbid something bad were to happen to you. All of those people can reach out and help you. All of those people have a stake in your life and you have a stake in theirs. And so I think, yeah, conservative policies of all stripe, but conservative education policy in general, again, should say, how are we working with the civil society? How are we building up the civil society? How are we connecting more people to the civil society to create these sort of denser, richer communities? Yeah, it strikes me that the hybrid homeschool idea is just a exemplary version of these civil institutions that we rely on. It's intentional. The service that is provided is sort of diffuse and that has a lot of hands in it. You know, in some ways, uh, it, it makes me think of uh, a bunch of Amish folks raising a barn, right? Like they have a purpose, they're working together. And yeah, when you work together, it really does knit together a community in a way that, you know, we belong to the same tennis club might not quite have the same intentionality and drive. Yeah, for sure. That that whole idea of being united in a common task, you know, it it causes, I mean, to me, it just drives all of these wonderful behaviors out of people. It causes you to put yourself second and the cause first. You have to compromise with other people. You have to, you know, rely on other people. Other people rely on you. It, it puts aside all the kind of petty differences that you might have with people because you need to, to accomplish this task. Deep engagement with the civil society just brings out the best in us. And I think these schools are a great example that they're really bringing out the best in a lot of these families and educators. So, Mike, your third criterion is conservative education policy should endeavor to pass on the store of accumulated knowledge. Build that out for me. Yeah. So, I mean, again, conservatism is about conserving things. And uh, one of the things that I think conservatives should believe is that over the course of human history, lots of knowledge, lessons have been learned and need to be passed down. They were passed down to us and we have to pass them down to the generation that's after us. So I think I quote in the piece, Sir Roger Scruton, you know, I think he made this really compelling argument of thinking of ourselves. Oftentimes when we talk about the sort of social contract, you know, we sort of look horizontally and we look at the whole kind of community. And these are all the people that sort of we have obligations to and have obligations to us and that we have to work together with one another and, and, and look after and answer to and whatever. And, and Scruton's argument was like, well, actually, not only do you, should we look horizontally, but we also need to sort of look vertically. We need to think about all of the people who came before us and all of the people who will come after us and think about the obligations that we have to them. Like we have an obligation to our ancestors who came before us, who have learned things. And we have an obligation to, to sort of be stewards of that knowledge, to safeguard that knowledge and to pass it on to the next generation of people. And so I think that that's should again, whenever, whatever education policy that we're talking about, I think it's really important that, that conservatives think about are we living up to that? Are we honoring the sacrifices and respecting the lessons that the people that have come before us have learned? And are we trying to pass that on to, to people after us? I mean, the, the sort of the antithesis of this, of the more sort of progressive mindset is everything it was in the French Revolution. You know, they, they established year zero or year one or whatever. Like, no, we're starting with the blank slate. We're throwing out everything that came before us and we're starting entirely fresh. And obviously, it's like a deeply non-conservative thing to do. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe the stuff that came before wasn't great, but there's like a lot of good stuff in there and you should take the good stuff and then you should get rid of the bad stuff and try and add more good stuff to it. So I think, again, lots of these schools, I don't think it's a, a coincidence that lots of these schools are, uh, are organized around like classical education models that are very deeply connected to the great books and the sort of literary canon and... Um, the, again, the great lessons have been learned over the course of the last several thousand years. And so I think conservatives should support that. And so they should support that insofar as it's being done in hybrid homeschools, but in other places where folks are trying to do that, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, it also strikes me that there's just a much 
greater facility that parents can understand what is actually being taught in a hybrid homeschool because they got to drive the bus as opposed to, you know, oftentimes when you have your kid in not just a public school, but a parochial school or a private school, you're just not there. You're really uh, asking the school to carry that forward. That's not necessarily bad, but there is a requisite distance there that certainly somebody who's going to choose to engage in a hybrid homeschool and certainly, you know, full-time homeschool is going to have a clear proximity to what that accumulated store of knowledge looks like and what their kids are receiving. For sure. And look, and it's totally true that there are a fair number of of hybrid homeschool models that have very progressive ideologies that are Waldorf based or Montessori based or others. So it was really funny sort of after I wrote this piece, some people that are more on the left sort of said like, I'm not really persuaded by this. And I'm like, yeah, well, you weren't really the audience. I was, I was saying I could, if, if some, you know, the center for American progress asked me to write a piece of why, uh, why people on the left should support them. I would, I would make a different set of arguments, even though I do think there are clearly lots of places where left-leaning people have supported these. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, in lots of other cases, families sort of pass off that authority to other people. And the hope would be that they trust them and they want to work together with them. But yeah, this is a case where families really want to stay involved in that. And they want to have a really open channel of conversation between their parents and uh, or between the teachers and between them and between their kids. And there's a really, really sort of tight knit view that like the parents and the teachers and the everybody's on the same team and that students get this kind of consistent the same things that are taught in their home are the same things that are taught in their school. And so rather than working across purposes, they're really working with each other. That's a great segue. Mike, you did write this piece about the reasons that conservatives should support hybrid homeschooling. And, you know, you mentioned these other folks. Well, I might have written a different piece, but, you know, what is the pitch for people who are like, yeah, I'm just not conservative. I, I don't really value those reasons. But what's the value proposition in hybrid homeschooling? for folks, um, you know, with a more leftward tilt. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if we look back to like some of the same animating arguments from homeschooling from the 60s and 70s that we talked about earlier, you know, that this hybrid homeschooling allows for a different kind of pedagogy, like a much, if you want it to, it can be a much more progressive pedagogy where students have a lot, a lot more time for sort of free activities and, and art and, you know, exploring in nature. And if you think of some of the animating ideologies of things like Waldorf education or Montessori education, where you want to have kids to be much more free to kind of pursue the things that they find interesting and sort of protect them from people that are trying to kill their creativity or whatever, you know, having more time at home gives kids a lot more time to do that if that's how you if that's how you want to use that time. So I think that there's lots of reasons why people with just a more progressive sort of ideology or ethos could really see, you know, again, wanting to have more time with their kids to be able to impart those same values and those same thoughts to them. So I'm interested to get back as we uh, sort of close up here, Mike, about, you know, what's the near future for hybrid homeschooling? I got to tell you, there's been a sea change in the experience of millions of American students and families about what school looks like. I'm sure that there's a number of parents who have experienced a front row seat onto the, the work their kids have done and said, really, is this, is this what we're doing all this work for? This seems, you know, underwhelming. So we very well could have a growing appetite for homeschool options and hybrid homeschooling seems like a particularly accessible version of that, right? Like you don't necessarily have to go whole hog. Is there any chance that this gets a shot in the arm here? Or do you think that uh, the gap between sort of part-time remote learning and hybrid homeschooling is uh, bigger than I'm sort of leading on? No, I think, I think this is going to give them a shot in the arm. And one of the things that I think is important to look at, you know, there's a lot of polling that's coming out now talking about, you know, how many parents, you know, that are, that are viewing homeschooling more favorably or that would, you know, are thinking about ways of, of educating their kids. And it's tough because we're right in the moment of it. It'd be interesting to see. And, and again, there's sort of stated preferences versus what they might actually do. One of the things to think about is like, it does, if, if only 1%, like we just have 1% of family decide to do that, that's tons and tons and tons of kids, right? Like, it doesn't actually, because there are 55 million school children or however many there are in the system, right? 
even small changes in the percentages of people who choose to do this from the perspective of that industry or from the, of that sector could be huge. So yeah, do I think we're going to get to a future where like a third of American school children are in a school like this? No, but could it reach like charter school levels? I think so. I mean, I think it's definitely possible, especially if you already have, you know, 1.7 uh, million kids in a traditional homeschooling environment. Like, could we see a similar size of that or larger in some sort of hybrid homeschool environment? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we probably could. Again, honestly, there's tons of hurdles and stuff to actually get those schools stood up and, and it'll take a while for that to happen. But I do think, I mean, look, I look at the research that you have done about sort of how school districts have responded to the coronavirus and that there is a substantial number of school districts that really haven't done well, right? There's a, a lot of school districts that did their level best and did well, but you highlighted a substantial portion of schools with lots and lots of kids that are involved in them that didn't really rise to the challenge of this. And so I could see lots and lots of parents that are in those school districts saying, man, we got to think about something else. And just, you know, it was interesting as I've been, you know, doing research on these schools while the coronavirus was going on. One of the things that's worth noting is that these schools were able to translate into a coronavirus world basically overnight, right? Because they said, all right, normally you do two days at home. Now you're doing five days at home. A lot of the structures were already in place. A lot of the expectations, the culture, all of the stuff that actually makes things work in schools was already there. And so insofar as we're thinking about trying to build a more resilient education system, just because bad stuff happens all the time, hurricanes happen, um, school shootings happen, I mean, like any number of horrible things can happen to schools. If we're thinking about building systems that are more resilient, these types of schools that have these stronger communities, that have tighter connections between parents and teachers, they're just able to roll with the punches much better than schools where those connections aren't as tight and where families are much more doing just sort of like dropping their kids off and leaving everything to the school. Because when the school falls down, it's like, whoa, wait a second, what do we do here? If you've already been sharing the load and instead of, you know, now it's 50-50, now it's got to go 80-20 or something, it's not as much of a, a difference as going from 100-0 to like 80-20. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I, I, I do suspect that there's something there. I mean, there's just a simple function of, when demand goes up, so does supply. I think you've probably heard of that before. And, you know, I've seen stats on districts that offer virtual schools and they're doubling their enrollments because people are scared. They're, they're trying to deal with this uncertainty. And this is an interesting option that might not be too far distant for what they expect in the coming year anyway. For sure. Mike, if there's not a lot of coverage of these schools, there's not a lot of places to go to kind of figure out where they are, what they're doing. Are there any resources that people could look to just as far as, uh, you know, books about them, associations, anything like that? So, yeah, well, I can tell you my book on this topic will be coming out probably late this year or early next. It is due to the publisher. We're recording this on, what, June 19th. Um, uh, it's due to the publisher on August 1st, uh, and, and then that'll be published sometime after that. So I think the definitive resource is just a few months away. But no, I would, I would point to a couple of things. So I've been writing a lot about this. So if you look at either the work that I've done on Ed Choice's blog or on my Forbes columns or others, so if you just Google me and hybrid homeschooling, I've been doing tons of stuff on this. Yeah, you're right that there actually aren't a ton of researchers and other people looking at them. One person I would direct people to, there's a professor at Kennesaw State University named Eric Warren. He's, uh, I think he's working on a book on this as well. I don't know whose book is going to come out first. I don't know. Uh, it will go from, we will, there will be an infinite percentage increase in the number of books on this because he and I will, will both have them come out, uh, I think close to the same time as one another. But he's done a bunch of great writing on this. He's done actually some of the only sort of academic journal articles on it. He's done some sort of surveys and stuff of people doing it that are all super interesting. And there's been some, yeah, if you look at the university model, so I think it's like UMSI. Uh, dot org. And actually, I think someone associated with the university model did write a book a few years ago about that specific model. The name is escaping me there, but there is a book specifically about that. But yeah, you're right. There isn't a ton of, there isn't a ton of stuff uh, on this out there already, but I'd definitely check out Eric's stuff and uh, my stuff as well. Well, Mike, we'll look forward to the book and thanks for coming on the report card. Thanks for having me, man. It was great talking to you. Thanks for listening to the report card and special thanks to our guest, Mike McShane. 
I also want to thank our producers that make this podcast possible. That's Matt Rice and Tyler Hoover. Take a minute to subscribe to The Report Card on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. We always want to get your comments, questions, or topic suggestions. Drop us a line at ed.podcast at AEI.org. That's all for this week. I'm Matt Malkus. Thank you.